So when I wrote my abstract for this paper quite some time ago, I had planned on making it about a series of agricultural experiments conducted by this man, Frank Engeldau, a botanist, plant breeder and geneticist who worked at the University of Cambridge. However, when I actually began to put the paper together, I began to feel that for a topic such as the history of agricultural experimentation, such a case study was perhaps not the most ambitious thing I could do. Instead, that I, fell, I feel that something more broad is appropriate. This sadly means that we're going to have to wave goodbye to Frank Engeldau and his experiments, and instead say hello to my new title, <laughs> and hello to Bruno Latour, and in particular his book, The Pasteurisation of France. Now, do not worry. I am not doing anything massively ambitious or weird. In brief, all my paper will attempt to demonstrate is that Bruno Latour's in interpretation of the history of microbiology as given in the pasteurisation of France can be picked up and transplanted to explain the rise of the gene in agricultural plant breeding. But why would we do such a thing? After all, everyone knows the pasteur pasteurisation of France, and it's been available in English since 1988, just like me. <laughs> Many of you in the audience, who are terribly old and wizened, might also be terribly bored of this book. Well, for my purposes, this is precisely the, what makes the pasteurisation of France such an attractive choice. Secondly, the subject matter of the pasteurisation of France is already, in and of itself, relatively agricultural. Things like brewers, farmers and sheep matter for Latour. Once again, then, this makes for an efficient extension of our histories of experimentation into the agricultural world. Thirdly, if you end up agreeing with me that Latour's history of the rise of the microbe can be extended to explain the rise of the gene in plant breeding and agriculture, a historiography that I'll get to shortly, then we have increased Latour's argument's explanatory power and can begin asking why this resemblance exists. Fourthly, this kind of broad analysis is one potential way in which our histories of plant breeding around the world might come to be synthesised. Over the past few decades, the place of agriculture in the history of genetics has improved dramatically and has often included elements of cross-national comparison. Indeed, as my general history of plant breeding relies heavily on the most recent research produced by a great many historians around the world, it's worth stating at the start precisely what my claim to novelty is. What I'm claiming as novel is the direct analogy and extension of Latour's analysis of pasteurianism to plant breeding and genetics and the way in which I spell out this general history. This gives us, I hope, at least one, in, one way in which to synthesise the numerous histories of agricultural genetics that we have, which are otherwise largely confined to individual national contexts. Fifthly, and finally, it's fun. Putting this together has been like completing a crossword puzzle, trying to make all the right bits correspond correctly and seeing if you can actually make the thing work. Whether or not it's then appropriate to tell an audience about a great crossword puzzle you solved is a question that I'd rather save for another day. So before I begin, it's important to make one key point. The Latour of this paper is the Latour of the pasteurisation of France, and his chapter, Give Me a Laboratory and I Will Raise the World, in Nora Mulcahy's Science Observed. So if any of you have beef with Latour, it needs to be on these grounds. So, to begin. I will first very briefly, and very briefly, outline Latour's history of Pasteur and the rise of the microbe, in order to both refresh your memories and also give you the opportunity to assess my understanding. I will be picking out the aspects of his story that will then later be used as points of analogy for the history of plant breeding that I'll, I will then give subsequently. So, there are three key groups of actors within Latour's analysis. Firstly, there are the hygienists. They were made up of a wide variety of researchers, medical practitioners and social reformers who aligned their efforts under the banner of hygiene to tackle infectious diseases at their roots as they saw them, i.e. in dirt and filth and all their manifestations. Basically, think back to uh, Sally Shuttleworth's excellent plen uh, plenary last night. That's the hygienism. Lastly, and most simply, the hygienist movement existed prior to the scientific research eventually to be conducted by Pasteur. The second group of actors are the physicians. Thoroughly embedded in practices and knowledge of their own, educated and, apprenti and apprenticed in well-established traditions, physicians also constituted a diverse group. Some doctors were much wealthier than others, forming part of elite society, most weren't. Some physicians were much more heavily involved in the world of research than others, perhaps conducting research of their own or contributing to medical literary culture. Again, most didn't. Physicians could also, of course, be hygienists, though for the majority, such broader concerns were second to more urgent matters. The majority of their time and energy was focused on gathering clients and developing close relationships with them. As Latour describes it, the life of a physician was an infernal one, 
and carving out a French society, a space where it was possible to treat people for money, required a constant struggle. Lastly, the Pasteurians. Latour's book is, of course, dedicated to explaining how and why Pasteur's microbial science came to take on the significance that it did, despite the resistance it faced. Both hygienists with their emphasis on the environment and physicians with their close scrutiny of individual patients ought to have been deeply sceptical and downright resistant to the notion that the truly significant causes of disease were these putative and invisible organic agents, agents that could easily evade cordon sanitaire and prevail in the face of the most dedicated treatments. Their own long-developed epistemologies and cultures had no place for such entities, and to, to surrender to the microbe would be to surrender to a little man working in, of all places, a laboratory, a location far from the real worlds in which they actually worked. Now, Latour makes a number of important and key contributions in answering how they all came to unite around the microbe, and even celebrate the figure of Pasteur far and wide. To put the argument in its briefest terms, without, I hope, doing any damage to it, Pasteur and his followers massaged the microbe, put it through its paces, in order to make it a valuable commodity in the economies of hygienists and physicians, who, once equipped with this remarkable unit of analysis, could do as they always had done. For the hygienists, this process involved Pasteur somewhat directing his research programme towards the world as hygienists understood it, by showing not just that the microbe could cause disease, but could also explain why so much of the hygienist project produced hit-and-miss results. As Latour writes, as soon as Pasteur, using anthrax, reproduced in the laboratory the influence of the environment on the virulence of a microbe, all the power of the hygienist movement shifted and became belief in the laboratory of the Rue de Homme. Such is the hygienist story. The process of bringing physicians into line was a little more arduous, as there was no part of their working life that could, be not, could not be harnessed in a similar mood. Instead, physicians had to be found work in a Pasteurian world, a Pasteurian world that otherwise only offered them greater redundancy. Eventually, physicians became distributors for the newly produced serums emerging from Pasteurian laboratories, i.e. work was found. Now, there is, of course, a great deal more to Latour's book, which Google Scholar tells me has been cited over 2,000 times. However, to my knowledge, it has never been cited in order to attempt what I'm going to do next. I would now like to make the argument that Latour's interpretation of the rise of the microbe in late 19th century France can be used as a model for understanding the rise of the gene in early 20th century agricultural plant breeding. In doing so, we can see what one history of experimentation might look like. I'm going to proceed by making Latour's three groups analogous with three of my own. I will then expand on these analogies and bring them to life by simply taking key parts of Latour's text and inserting the agricultural genetical analogues. This, I feel, will be the quickest and most efficient way to try and get you all thinking in line with me. So, as an aside, this is hopefully, tactically, a similar move to the one that Pasteur made with the hygienists, in that I'm showing you something that you all like, Latour, taking it back to my own warped and shady historiographical laboratory, and then transforming it before your very eyes, in ways that I sincerely hope will benefit both of us. But that, of course, is only if it works. So, here are my analogous groups. I'll start with the easiest to understand, the equivalence of Pasteurians with the Mendelians of the early 20th century. In both cases, a new theory emerged within a rich and competitive research environment. In both cases, researchers claimed grand significance for their new science, which, though beginning in small investigations, were soon extended into human and non-human biology. Both had also claimed to make visible a new unit of analysis that had otherwise remained invisible. The microbe made visible by dead sheep, the gene made visible by the, the appearance of character traits in three-to-one ratios. There are important dissimilarities, of course. Firstly, that genetics was an international project from the beginning, and indeed famously began with a priority dispute amongst Mendel's rediscoverers. There was no one central figure like Pasteur, other than Mendel himself, who then did very quickly become something analogous to Pasteur, the scientific hero figure. If we did wish to find a figure directly analogous to Pasteur, someone who actually moved like, uh, uh, like that man in the Tours sense, we would be hard pushed to do better than the figure of Wilhelm Johansson, another hero from the history of genetics, who, by using a series of experiments, sharpened up that unit of analysis, the gene, which he so named, and then gave greater form to it by establishing a distinction between genotype and phenotype, which grounded much of 20th century Mendelian genetics. And, as I will explain shortly, doing so helped make the gene a valuable commodity in the eyes of Mendelism's erstwhile competitors, the plant breeders. Before moving on to the plant breeders, I have there used the word laboratory, when in New Hansen's case, the laboratory included the field. Now, some of you might have different views on this, but in Latour, the difference between lab and field seems to have mattered. 
and that to try and equate Johansson's fields with Pasteur's laboratories is therefore a misstep. I would disagree. While the language of Lab and Field does matter in Latour's story, considering that he is ultimately dedicated to breaking down the boundaries between lab, the lab and the outside world, I think it is safer to accept the difference between lab and field as merely a simplification, one which has been made more or less aggressively by scientific researchers in the past, often by rhetorical means, and sometimes by historians today, in order to keep an already complicated story somewhat simpler. Or to put things uh, another way, there are, on my view, more laboratories than laboratories, and if we allow this, the tour can be extended to agricultural genetics, I think without too much problem. Now, plant breeders as equivalent to hygienists. This analogy is somewhat less strong, as plant breeders are not typically seen as having a grand plan for the transformation of society in the same way as the hygienists did. However, if we include within the category plant breeders, those scientists, politicians, businessmen, economists, food processors, etc., who all saw in agricultural science, and in particular in novel plant varieties, a solution to much wider agricultural and geopolitical problems, then plant breeders as a group can come to be recognised as something much more like hygienists. Firstly, both had well-developed and vibrant research cultures, which provided an exceptionally fertile social context that could be harnessed and used to the benefit of Mendelians, in the same way that hygienists were harnessed and used to the benefit of Pasteurians. As the Pasteurians had brought hygienists on side with the gift of the microbe, which, once suitably massaged, could allow them to continue in their revolutionary schemes, so did the geneticists bring plant breeders on side, with the greater legitimacy lent to the power of varietal selection once the key hereditary unit, the gene, had been identified. These were no longer just plant varieties, but Mendelian plant varieties. This is a point made by a great many historians of plant breeding, so once again, my novel contribution is to place it within a Latourian tradition. Now, physicians as analogous to farmers. The analogies I am claiming include those of the place of the individual farmer within the wider agricultural industry, alongside the place of the individual physician within the wider medical community, i.e. both had to be constantly working in practical terms, both were strongly in competition with their fellow farmers or physicians, and both were facing stringent economic times. Moreover, physicians and farmers can be taken as analogous in the makeup of their communities. Just as some physicians were successful enough and wealthy enough to be members of elite society, so some farmers with very large estates and plenty of labourers mixed in the upper echelons of political and social life. Again, just as physicians displayed a variety of the levels to which they were educated, so some farmers might have attended agricultural colleges, while perhaps most did not. Finally, just as some physicians were much more deeply engaged with contemporary research, so some farmers were much more deeply engaged with contemporary research, and perhaps made their facilities available to the Royal Agricultural Society or the Board of Agriculture or local agricultural colleges for demonstration work and research programmes, though again, as with physicians, most did not. The majority of farmers were occupied with the primary business of actually bringing in their crops and managing their cattle, just as physicians were dedicated to their patients and ensuring they brought on new ones. So, these are my general analogical connections. To show how they might be operationalised in a new synthetic history of genetics in agricultural plant breeding, I will take key moments in the tour's text, first in their microbial form and then transforming them to the genetical. Firstly, let's consider the tour's own condensed version of his principal argument, what he calls the Pasteurian Spring. Agricultural geneticists tended to complete these first and second stages somewhat in tandem, Visiting farms, learning about crop diseases firsthand, going to see how well a particular variety grew under normal cultivation, or simply going out into the world to find novel plant breeding material, were all part of their daily lives. To borrow from the tool, the Mendelians moved, but remained men of the laboratory. As for the second stage, provided we allow, as I said earlier, that the fields attached to plant breeding centres and research institutes are merely another form of laboratory, though of course with problems of their own, just as more typical laboratories have, then geneticists in the early 20th century completed the second stage routinely. This is simply to say that in their own fields, their controlled environments, the expertise of the geneticist is protected from the expertise of external competitors, just as Pasteur held the higher ground in the laboratory. To put it into Latourian, it was under this double condition of being both lab and field that agricultural plants came to be redefined as composed of genes. Mendelians learned from people on the ground, farmers, politicians, food processors, commercial plant breeders, both the problems to be solved and the goals to be achieved. 
This was the only way of answering all objections concerning the link between the new agent, the gene, and the old agent, the varieties produced by the talented and perceptive plant breeder. That was me as Latour. Right? The agricultural analogue for the third stage would, in my estimation, include all the mechanisms for control of their varieties that agricultural geneticists came to put in place. In various countries, this included new laws uh, as to how seeds could be sold, special certified seed sacks, ongoing supervision of the multiplication process, and so on. Here is where the link between, in the microbial case, the pasteurians and the hygienists, and in my case, the Mendelians and the plant breeders, comes to life. I'll just allow you to read that while I scan down. Mendelism and the unit of the gene gave to plant breeding the kind of efficacy that justified governmental action to protect certain varieties and officially raise their status, gave plant breeders everywhere the opportunity to multiply their own social standing as masters of genes rather than merely varieties, and also provided the basis for increased commercial opportunities, and moreover, firmer grounds upon which to rest their raison d'etre, which was simply that breeding and heredity actually matters, and that it matters enough for farmers to need to spend more money on it. As in the case of the hygienists, it did not matter, therefore, if all plant breeders everywhere didn't immediately grasp Mendelism in its entirety, and continued, as historians have shown, to produce and sell varieties through practices not entirely in accordance with its scientific principles. For instance, varieties that predated the Mendelians continued to be bought and sold. But nevertheless, the industry expanded, companies and uni university departments grew, and the world was moved, all thanks to the gene. Now that's plant breeders taken care of. What about farmers? So, <clears throat> numerous studies in the history of agricultural science and technology have shown that farmers are just as good a case in sociology for the redefinition of one social group of the role of another social group. What farming is, what it is for, how it should be managed, who should manage it, are exceptionally highly contested. The process by which genetics has transformed agriculture has been a far longer story than Latour's history of change in the practice of physicians. Firstly, just as some physicians did, many farmers could simply ignore all the glitzy new varieties being released under, under the banner of Mendelism. Many couldn't afford them. Instead, farmers had to be brought into line via more complex routes, which included uh, laws that define the legality or illegality of seed stocks. Just as some physicians saw in bacteriology an opportunity to professionalise and rationalise the medical industry, so too have people seen in modern farming methods a way to reconstruct the agricultural industry, stigmatising those who don't adopt as inefficient and not progressive and so on. As with my general view of, uh, overview of the history of plant breeding, I'm not claiming to have uncovered anything new by descri describing farmers in similar terms. Far from it, I'm basing this all on work conducted by a great many other historians. My novelty is again to bring this history of agricultural science within the framework of Latour's history of Pasteur and his experiments. By doing so, we can better appreciate the place of genetics within this industry and its significance for society, as Latour could just as easily have written. Historians of genetics are already talking like this, though not on explicitly Latourian grounds. I think that highlighting this potential for synthesis, both within the history of plant breeding and between histories of genetics and microbiology, enriches both Pasteurianism and Mendelism, and moreover, might have more uses than I by myself can imagine, and so I have shared it with you. Thank you.